Hello, my name is Lawrence Burian, and on behalf of the American Society for Yad Vashem, it is my pleasure to introduce you to an important conversation in our Lessons from Our Parents series. This series features entrepreneurs, philanthropists, builders, and dreamers who proudly lay claim to being children of Holocaust survivors. We will explore how these parents' experiences influenced and continue to profoundly impact their children's personal and professional lives and gain insight into the lessons their parents taught them that made them into the leaders they are today. It is my pleasure today to have this conversation with two individuals who, in addition to being first cousins, are partners in business and in many philanthropic efforts. Lenny Wilf is principal partner of Garden Homes, one of the largest privately held companies in New Jersey. Garden Homes owns and manages properties throughout the country and is nationally recognized for its ownership and management of shopping centers, office buildings, and hotels. Lenny is also an owner and vice chairman of the Minnesota Vikings football team of the NFL. Lenny earned his BA degree from Boston University his law degree from Georgetown University, where he was editor of the Law Journal, and a Master of Law in Taxation from NYU. Lenny is married to Beth and has four children. Mark Wilf is principal partner of Garden Homes as well. He is also an owner and president of the Minnesota Vikings football team. Mark received his BSc degree from Princeton University in electrical engineering and computer science and earned his JD degree from the NYU School of Law. Mark is married to Jane and also has four children. Lenny and Mark Wilf are first cousins who continue the Wilf family tradition of civic involvement and generous support of causes both local and global. Lenny's and Mark's leadership in charity and outreach has been recognized at the highest levels. They are active participants in the Jewish community, leading supporters of Jewish causes, and profoundly dedicated to the preservation of the memories of the Holocaust. Lenny presently serves as the chairman of the American Society for Yad Vashem, which is the sponsor of today's program. He was also appointed by President Clinton to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council, and his family was among the original founders of the Holocaust Museum in Washington and the Heritage Museum in New York. Mark is chairman of the board of JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America, and has served as its national campaign chairman and chair of their national initiative to raise funds for the social welfare of Holocaust survivors living in the United States. He is also a board member of the American Society for Yad Vashem. Lenny and Mark's philanthropic work extend way beyond Jewish causes in the United States and Israel to include the spheres of education and youth, health and human services, and arts and culture. Both Lenny and Mark serve on numerous other charitable and educational boards, including, just for example, the New York Presbyterian Hospital, the JDC, the Jewish Federation of Greater Metro West, the Anti-Defamation League, New York University, Princeton University, Vanderbilt University, my alma mater, Yeshiva University, the Jewish Education Center, and the Rabbinical College of America. It is with great honor and pleasure to welcome both of you, Mark and Lenny, for today's discussion. Let's jump right in. Lenny, I, I know that your father was born in Yaroslav, Poland, and your mother was from uh, Tarnow, Poland. Correct. Would you be kind enough to share with our audience just a bit more about uh, an overview of their Holocaust experience? Okay, um, my late father and my late uncle uh, grew up in Yaroslav. They had a sister and their parents, Oscar and Ella, they lived there, they had a shoe store. And when um, 
the war broke out, uh, the sister uh, went to Warsaw Ghetto, where she died there. And the two brothers, including the parents, I assume were deported east, not necessarily voluntarily, but they were deported east and ended up in uh, what now is Russia, Siberia. And they worked in a, a labor camp during the course of the war. On my mother's side, um, she came from a large family and her parents and five of the seven siblings were all sent to Belgius, which is a was basically a death factory. It was not a concentration camp. And I think they were, according to the records, were either shipped in 41 or 42, where they were all murdered. I had the, I won't call it a pleasure, but I had the opportunity to go to Belgius, where a memorial was built in memory of the 600,000 victims. And we were able to build a little memorial as well as a little, what I would call a mini museum to the memory of the place. It's not pretty and it's very haunting when you go there, but I think it was important and we did go. Um, the family was originally from what I call the three adjoining cities of Krakow, which you all heard of, Tarnow to the east of Krakow. And the other one you've heard of was, was called in Polish Auschwitz, but we know it as Auschwitz. And if you look at the map geographically from one to the other, it was roughly about 30 kilometers in each way from Krakow. So that's my um, relationship to the Holocaust. Mark, your, your dad and Lenny's dad were brothers. So I imagine they uh, had a very similar experience. Obviously, if uh, you want to elaborate on, uh, on that background, that would be great. But also, if you could tell us a bit um, about your mother's story. I've had the privilege of actually meeting both of your parents. Uh, your dad was an unbelievably charming man, and your mom is a, an extraordinary woman. So tell us a bit about, about uh, that background. Well, thank you. Thank you for that compliment, and I uh, couldn't agree with you more. And the, 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 the fact is, uh, my dad, my uncle were extremely close, having grown up together like they did in, in the years, and even in the years subsequent, uh, they, they were extremely close and they were a great example of uh, together as a family. And uh, as, as my cousin mentioned, uh, they were deported uh, to Siberia. In fact, my father oftentimes did not necessarily consider himself a Holocaust survivor. He felt living out the war in, in Russia, uh, actually, they, they, they were able to avoid some of the horrors that, for instance, my aunt went through in Warsaw and, 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 and perished there and, and, and others that are, that survived the camps and so forth. So, um, they were deported east and eventually they, they, uh, my father, uncle and, and grandparents, uh, they went to a part of, of the Soviet Union that was halfway between Japan and Germany to be as far from the war as possible. That's how they survived the war. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that's 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 how they how they went through it. Uh, you mentioned my mom; uh, she had a much more harrowing experience in many ways uh, than my dad did. Uh, they met actually after the war in Germany, uh, but uh, my mother survived the war. Um, my grandmother, my babu Miriam Fish, uh, she she was in the Lvov ghetto uh, in 1942. Uh, they were able to escape the ghetto. Uh, my grandmother. And my mother and uncle, who were small children at the time, they had Christian papers, and they were able to leave the ghetto. And they lived on a farm. The woman who owned the farm did not know they were Jewish. In fact, if she knew they were Jewish, she would have turned them in. And uh, they lived for two years on that farm every day, worrying in German-occupied territories if they'd survive. And my grandfather did not have those Christian papers, and my grandmother hid my grandfather under the floorboards of a barn for two years. It, it, at that farm? At that farm. And the people who owned the farm had no idea? Had no idea. And so they'd bring him food every night, and it was a, every hour, it was a, a very perilous and for two treacherous years. for two years. And, and uh, that's how they survived the war, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's the legacy that, uh, these, these that stories, they went through. These stories are extraordinary. I, I, Lenny, I, I would ask you, um, growing up in a home... Uh, with parents who are survivors, did they did they talk about it when you were growing up, or was it taboo? Um, and if they did talk about it, was it age appropriate? 
Uh, what was the dynamic in your home? Well, it certainly wasn't taboo to talk about it, but it certainly wasn't encouraged either. Um, I learned a lot from my parents as they got older and my father got ill and I kind of made him tell me to a lot of the stories. And my mother always, you know, she didn't hide anything, but she always, I always got a sense from her that something was missing and what was missing for her was the rest of her family. While we, she would discuss it, she wasn't comfortable discussing it. Uh, she had one older sister who actually outlived her um, and they were pretty close and I was very close with Actually, I'm still close with uh, Mark's mother, my aunt, but my other aunt was, was my mother's sister. We were pretty close also. And um, the stories were, were pretty, pretty serious. What's interesting is I always tell people, while my father and my uncle were deported east, so was my mother and her sister, but they actually were sent east first by their father. Uh, because he felt that there was going to be a problem. And he, he had the foresight to do it. He had the foresight to send them east. Uh, I think at the time, my mother, her older sister, I think was seven or eight years older than her. And she was like her, let's call it guardian at the time. She was a teenager. My mother was still much younger. And that's how they survived in Russia. But it was, I don't think they were deported. They were just sent east. Other than growing up with your cousins, obviously, did, did you have other friends who were children of survivors? Oh, yes. Um, our families first came to America, actually New Jersey. The survivor community was not, I won't say they were welcome, but not with open arms, the best way to describe it at that time. Uh, and they kind of made their own way. Over the years, obviously, we became part of the uh, community. But at the beginning, we were not really part of the established Jewish community in New Jersey after the war. It took a while. So, Mark, you mentioned that, um, if I understood correctly, that your aunt had perished at the, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, when you were growing up, was that something that was spoken about? Did you know of her? I, I'd love to, by the way, know her name. And same question I asked Lenny in terms of, uh, did you grow up sort of proud to be the child of a survivor, embarrassed, uh, neither? How, how did it make you feel? Oh, I, her name was Bella, and I still am astonished when I tell people this, but I did not know that I had an aunt or an aunt that perished till I was 24 years old. Um, that gives you an idea of the kind of things that my cousin was talking about. Uh, they were busy making a life in America. Uh, these were very painful memories. And I think also they wanted to protect us to a degree that we would have as normal and a, a, a acclimated life to, to society here as possible. And uh, like my cousin said, for himself and myself, I, I, I pushed to find out more. Um, I remember going in 1980, I was I'm born in 1962. So at 18 years old, I went to Israel. There was a reunion of Holocaust survivors from all over the world. And they talked about uh, the survivors in a reunion and they had sessions for next generation and the issues, what kind of mental things, or this and that for children. And to me, it was all, I didn't know what they were talking about. But this was, this was an eye-opener. And then um, when I was in law school, I pushed my dad to go back to those places, to go back on a trip with him to Russia and Poland. My mother wouldn't go back. And when we went on that trip, I really poked my dad for, with a lot of questions about the stories. And that's when I find out about my aunt and about the journeys. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that growing up, it was, we had a lot of our friends and our circles were, uh, I, I'm on the youngest uh, end of the, of the children of survivors, but as uh, am I, <laughs> right. But, uh, the survivor community in New Jersey, it's, 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 a, it's, um, a lot of them in the real estate community, builders of so much of, of New Jersey were Holocaust survivor families. And they grew up going on vacations together and, and, uh, and, and friendships together. And, and, and that was, that was the way we grew up. So, uh, it, it's something, uh, even myself, I look back and I, I'm just always astonished at, over time, uh, as they got older, they shared more and more with us, and uh, we wanted to learn more and more. Now, I, I'd like to come back to that in a moment, because when you talk about this idea of the survivor community becoming builders and, and moving forward and the kind of resilience that that took, um, I, I think it's not an uncommon experience with survivors that only after they've reestablished themselves and have a little bit more 
maybe distance from it, can they start opening up? They obviously need to have children who want to hear it uh, and are receptive and listen in the right way. But before we turn to that, I, I want to ask you, Lenny, um, you know, the, the stories about your two fathers and their relationship uh, are legendary. Um, and, you know, even when I walked into your offices, the, the picture of the two of them together is, is striking. And you can see that it, 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 it pervades uh, everything that you do. Um, if I understand correctly, they actually built identical homes next door to each other and that you guys grew up sharing a backyard. Um, can you elaborate a bit on this relationship of these two brothers? And, and, and I'm sorry, and, and, what, and what you take from it? Um, well, there was a time, I think, from 1950 till 52 or 53, where they were separated because my uncle was living in America already. But my father, for whatever reason, decided to stay in Germany, where I was born. And then, of course, um, the grandfather, their father, Oscar, finally... Uh, the way I heard the story was he, he wrote a letter to my father, something like, you know, get yourself over here. <laughs> now, I don't know if it was Oscar who wrote it or my grandmother, Ella, because she was a tough woman. I, I tell my kids, you, you would be very happy to grow up in, in, in my household rather than with Ella, because I remember one year my parents went to Israel for six weeks and she was my caretaker for six weeks. And boy, was I happy to see my parents because <laughs> she was tough. I tell you a story in, in, in the, um, I guess it was the second office they had it was in the basement of one of the apartments and my grandma lived upstairs. And my father and uncle decided that they had to get her out of there because she was driving them crazy. Now, these were grown men already and with they're children. To, and they're trying to work. And they're trying to work. But she would come in and tell them what to do and everything. So they offered to buy her a nice condominium up the street. <laughs> and she said, I'm not going. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a family thing. We've always been very close. Um, kind of just continues that way. It's, you know, th th there's a commonality of interest, I would say. Obviously, business is one, uh, family too. I think the biggest, really the biggest commonality is the feeling for Israel and, and um, you know, charity, tzedakah. Uh, they did everything together. Um, they always felt comfortable doing things together, even when they disagreed. And we, we feel the same way. The only thing we ever argue about is football. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know it, it, it was so complimentary to how they were. They each had their uh, strengths and, and differences, but uh, they even shared a desk together for almost 30 years. They had the bookends of, so of two the desks. desks so desks together, and, and houses and on and the same. And just the way they probably slept together as, 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 as young, young children in a tight, tight environment, whatever it was. And I know to my dad's dying day, and, and I know for my uncle as well, just being together as a family, that example that they shared is something uh, we try to emulate as well. It's just um, uh, if, if you work together and get along, it's, it's, it's a very powerful force, and uh, uh, they were a great example of that. It's not easy to do, but to be an example and a role model, it's clear. Just look at the conversation we're having here with their, with their sons. Um, you know, I... Uh, what I had heard, don't know if it's true, because I, I thought, you know, these two identical houses, uh, very romantic, mirror images, mirror images, and and very romantic concept of their closest. I was told it was just because they wanted to save on design fees and construction costs. <laughs> that was part of the equation. You know, that they would just, you know, it was like we can we can pay the architect <laughs> once, and, and you know. But anyway, that's uh, uh, that's for a different conversation. Um, so, so Mark, uh, shifting more to the lessons that you that you've learned from them, and one we just talked about this importance of family and being together, and 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 philanthropy, which you mentioned. What are some of the other lessons that you've learned uh, from your parents that you, that you would attribute in some degree to their Holocaust or immigrant background? Well, certainly, you know, the Zionism and the love of Israel. I mean, the fact is. Um, their story is so remarkable about how they survived, but had they just survived and told those stories, that would have been one thing. But their example is more than just surviving. It's, it's, it's passing down to their children and grandchildren um, a love of Israel, a, 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 a importance of making sure the Jewish community is strong and thriving. And they live that example uh, where they spent their time, 
it was communally and giving back when it wasn't business and it wasn't family. That's where they, they chose to spend their time and, and their energy. And uh, they never tired of it. And the only reality we always knew is that back then there was no state of Israel and there was no Jewish community and there was no community anywhere or no people that cared about the Jewish community and what was happening in Europe. So that lesson uh, didn't have to be told to us. It was kind of, uh, you know, it was in the water, if you will. Um, and, and, and we just knew it instinctively. And that was the example we, we learned from to this day. Uh, we still, we would, still. Would you say, Mark, that you're able to transmit those lessons on to your own children? Um, are you taking some of the skills, or is it leading by example? Is it pedagogical? How how do you transmit that to yet? another generation, especially with, with at least it, your fathers and your mom. Yeah, no longer it, listen, it's, it's all of the above. It's not just for the Jewish community. It's for just humanity in general. How do you pass down history? How do you pass down lessons and not reliving horrors and being tolerant? And uh, I mean, we even talked today about social justice and a better world. So um, those are challenges that all of us face, but specifically in, in our family and, and, and the lessons of the Holocaust and Jewish history, it's a combination of all of it. It's pedagogical. It's by example. Uh, and I've always said it. You can talk to your blue in the face to your children about things, but you have to live it. You have to have them experience it and do things themselves to feel it and get that habit going. I mean, giving and communal experience we talked about earlier, Lenny and I, it's not something that's habitual. You have to, uh, it's not instinctive. You have to get the habit and the custom going by doing it. So um, these aren't easy questions, but uh, the one thing our, our dads taught us is um, if you do things by example the right way, um, that's, a, that's a great lesson. It's interesting though that I, I imagine that in your own home, the conversations about the history and the family probably started at a much younger age for your kids than you discovering at 24. Yes. So so there is a difference in how it's being transmitted. Exactly. Now. And in fact, my mom never really spoke about it much, but she's been in the schools and occasionally. So she's now, she's now. When they, not, you know, at least in my kids' schools and talk the story a little bit, which was each time I learn something new when I hear uh, their stories. So, um, Listen, our survivors are our gr greatest uh, teachers. Um, I, I, when I hear the stories and uh, some of the people that we know or are affiliated with, we've heard the stories for years and years. And even to this day, we still learn new things or nuances or uh, appreciate in a different way what they went through. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a legacy we need to, to pass on and make sure uh, they can contribute to the world that way. You know, Lenny, let me, let me ask the same question to you about takeaways and lessons that you've, that you've learned. You mentioned some of them um, from, from your parents, from this background. Um, you know, in, in particular, there's this extraordinary resilience that's demonstrated uh, by your parents. You talked to your mother in particular, losing so many members of her family. Um, to what do you attribute? that kind of strength, that kind of resilience. And do you see that translating to you practically, whether it be in your, your business life or your, or your personal life? Is that a particular um, lesson that's learned? I, I think so. I, I think that it starts from surviving the war. You had to have perseverance. You had to have good instincts. And you had to make decisions very, very quickly. And I think I learned that from my parents. Um, and I've learned that, you know, it's very, very helpful. Um, the, the resilience comes from the original perseverance, and that's how you build on it. And I can tell you, I won't go into details, but many times in business, I would hit a roadblock or we would hit a roadblock, and it never looked as something that was insurmountable. It was always, well, we have a problem, and what are we going to do about it? Uh, I've actually heard you say that many times at Yad Vashem meetings, which right. is, you know, what are we going to do? Yeah. Let's not wallow. You know, we can talk about it, but what are we going to do about it? And that's really how I think I learned that in business from my father and uncle. I, I tell the story uh, how when they built their first apartment in New Jersey, the cost of it was far in excess of what they were able to put together. 
So they took the thing and they broke it all down over a few weeks and they figured it out. And they, you know, basically redid everything to, to make it a, a better a better way for them. And, and that that's part of being resilient, not giving up on things and, and keep trying different things. And I think that's really the real lesson. Uh, same thing, you know, in terms of uh, the future. If, if something's not working, learn to accept its uh, demise and move on to something better. That's what I've tried to do with the American society. Whenever we had a problem, how do we fix it? And what are we going to do about it? And you've been doing a good job at that. Um, um, Mark, a question about business. I, I, I find it so interesting. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I'm sure you have. Your family's business has is responsible for, um, I assume, thousands of homes in the United States at this point. The irony of that to uh, parents who were displaced and homeless uh, and, and immigrants, it, it, has that ever... that is, is there any connection there or am I just, you know, playing pop psychology? Listen, b business is about sustaining and also to fuel a lot of their passions about community and giving back. They were builders in the truest sense of the wor word. And I'll give you a perfect example when it comes to where it intersects with the community. Um, I know very much uh, the history. Uh, I, I hear it uh, about when, when they first were getting more engaged in business in Israel. And they had opportunities to invest in properties, existing properties. And I know the story, my dad and uncle, that was the time they were uh, uh, approached to invest in a hotel in Israel. I think it was an existing hotel, but they were bent on building, building in Israel. Building something And in so uh, they set about, and we're very proud, and we still own hotels in Israel that, that our, our parents built, and we're very proud of that legacy, and we try to continue that legacy. So... Yes, it's a business to sustain, and, and, and even in the United States, but we're also very proud of the fact that uh, as a business, we employ many people, we house many people, and uh, that, that is a proud legacy they left, and we're trying to continue. What, what did your, um, or what does your mother think? I, I assume your father also had a chance to see uh, the purchase of, of the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, you can't get more American or North American, oh. at least, than well, American football. You know, a bit, a, a, did they, did they, could they even relate, or were well, they? Well, a, 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 a big part, a big part of our being integrated and part of the American society and the community was going to football games every Sunday. That was our rituals. And so you actually went to cousin, football with your parents. Always oh, sure. with, wow. with so dad, with uncle, football. all of us going to giant games. We went all over wherever they were. We went, and uh, in fact, um, our dads were building homes. For some of the former players, one of our one of our partners was a former college football player. We uh, still partners with the family to this day, and introduced uh, my dad and uncle and our whole family to football from even before when I was born, when in the fifties and and so forth. So uh, that love of football and sports, uh, uh, he was very supportive. My dad of our purchase of the team and, and loved it. And people would say to you, you know, what are you doing, a greener, a Holocaust yeah, survivor kidding. with football? And he just he just loved it. So. Um, just one last question for this part of the interview and or the discussion, I should say, and then uh, we'd want to shift gears. But Lenny, you've been you've been the the chairman of the American Society for Yad Vashem uh, for some time now, nine years. Um, and what what would you say for you has been some of the highlights or accomplishments that you want to maybe mention? There's so many, but things that maybe stand out for you over the years uh, working with Yad Vashem. Well, obviously, it's a, it's a multifaceted relationship over many years, including my uh, late uncle who helped build the museum. But for me personally, I went to a lot of events, Laza, but the thing that was the most fascinating was when we uh, inducted two Americans into the uh, garden of the uh, righteous persons. And we got uh, Ambassador Dermer to open up the embassy, the Israeli embassy in Washington for the event. And because uh, that it was President Obama came, it was the first time an American president ever came to the Israeli embassy. And I always tell the story, there were five speakers that night. And the last one was not me, but I was one of them. And I don't know why I was up there speaking because everybody else was famous, including President <laughs> Obama and Steven Spielberg and Rabbi Lau. And how did I get up there? But it's a memory I'll always treasure. I think you were there, if I remember. I had my wife and I think one or two of my children. So that's that was very special to me because what it meant was 
all the stuff I heard about Israel when I was growing up and you know, going and everything, and America, which I love, it kind of, I say, it put it together. Well, it's the perfect connection. Yeah, you talked yeah. about the Zionism right, right. and Holocaust memory right. and bringing it together at the U.S., at the Israeli embassy in D.C. Right. for a... And I should, I should add, they honored um, the memory of a, a woman named Lois Gundon. She was from Indiana, and she worked at... Uh, I guess it was like a Christian missionary in the south of France, and she hid Jewish children in the south of France. And of course, the other ones, the famous one was Sergeant Roddy Edmonds. And this is a, fa this is a more famous story. Um, he was an American sergeant, very quiet, from Knoxville, Tennessee. Nobody knew this story. Um, it was in 40, I guess it was 45, right before the end of the war. He was running a 1,200-person division, which was captured by the Germans. And the commandant of, of the uh, camp there said to Roddy Edmonds, uh, I want you to tell me who all the Jews are. And he said, we're all Jews. And all Amazing. the people lined up and said, we're all Jews. And the commandant put a gun to his head. He said, you can kill me, but it's almost the end of the war. You'll, you'll be um, indicted for war crimes. And the commandant put the pistol down. And I had honor that night of meeting three of the survivors. They were American Jewish soldiers. It's incredible, you know, actually... That's it, a story you'll it, never it forget. Actually, Lenny, it actually bridges, if you think about it, you know, three of your passions, right? It's it's the Zionism, it's Holocaust remembrance and education, but it's also your philanthropy with uh, not just Jewish causes, because this was recognizing righteous among the nations. These weren't even... These were not Jewish honorees. Um, so if, if we can uh, shift gears with your sure. permission... Uh, this is uh, what, 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 what I've been calling the lightning round. Okay, lightning round. Um, <laughs> so these are uh, rapid fire questions. They're off topic. The idea is just to let our audience get a, a, a more of an opportunity to get to know you and how you think. Uh, so let's, let's have some fun with it and uh, let's go. we're ready to roll. Okay. Uh, Mark, you, your cousin, your brother all have law degrees. Which one of you would have actually made the best full-time attorney? <laughs> well, I, I will tell you this. Uh, I don't know about a law degree, but I learned from my parents' diplomacy, and I'm going to say that we were all pretty much about the same on that level. So. Okay, well, well, a, a little birdie told me that when you were at Princeton, you, you actually were a sportscaster, um, and you announced football and... And basketball, what, yes. What was your best call? Oh, my best call was uh, Princeton beating Yale. Uh, that was that was That's a big huge. moment. That was, <laughs> that was a big deal in the Which Ivy sport? League. Which sport? Football. 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 Okay. And so that was uh, that was a good call. A lot but of screaming, or a lot of screaming, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So, so it was mentioned before that the Will family owns uh, uh, hotels or invests in hotels in Israel. What's the best part about owning a hotel in Israel? For me, it's that um, the family helped actually build the country. Um, and when I go there today, which you've been with me, I always say to myself, you know, what would m my father and my uncle think of Israel today? Because in my opinion, they would not recognize it. It's a totally different country than when they started building. I guess it was late 60s, early 70s. At that time, it was, it was just a place. And today it's a, a country. So... We, I feel, I'll speak for my, myself, I'm sure that my cousins feel the same way, I feel very proud of the fact that not only were we involved with Israel philanthropically, but that we helped build the country. We employed people, we still do, and uh, when I go to my hotels, it feels pretty good. So, so, so Mark, I'll let you be the bad guy. What's the worst part about owning hotels in Israel? Well, uh, really, uh, it, we always like to put a positive spin on things. So it's, listen, there, people, people asking you for, for, for discounts? No, or? well, <laughs> that's always part of business. But listen, there, there have been tough challenges, uh, certainly during intifadas and, and challenging times. But we're also proud that the hotels have sometimes uh, been part of helping uh, on the public side, whether it's uh, bringing in Olim or having a, a major political events there. So uh, I'd say there's a lot more good than, than bad good when it comes that. to all this. Um, Lenny, um, I, I don't think that your family has any deep uh, Minnesota roots before purchasing the Vikings. Is it true that uh, the family bought the Vikings because you already all owned purple ties? 
<laughs> well, if we got the purple ties, they came from YU. <laughs> oh, so, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> now they come from Minnesota. <laughs> so, so actually, you mentioned the Yeshiva University. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proud alum of Yeshiva University, and I, I remember with uh, great joy uh, living on the uh, Wilf campus. Uh, but my question to you, Mark, is can I blame you personally for the fact that there were no girls on campus? <laughs> no, that would be a higher authority, uh, very Talmudic reasons. So uh, <laughs> That's something you could work on. We'll take it up with the rabbinic <laughs> authorities at, at YU. Well, I, I think you ought to retract that question because I don't want it, your wife, Adina, to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, I, was, I was single in college. Doesn't matter. They have long memories, wives. <laughs> now, 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 Mark, you have a brother named Zygmunt. And... and do you have a complex that with a name like that and you're just Mark that you could just never be that cool? Well, it's a cool name, but uh, I'm, I'm pleased with my name and uh, you're, you're happy with I'm, it? I'm, good with, I'm <laughs> okay. good with who I am. Lenny, according to Wikipedia, the Vikings were, quote, seafaring Nordic peoples from the 8th to 11th centuries who pirated, raided, and traded from their northern European homelands. What in your personality is most similar to the Vikings? <laughs> um, Pirated, raided, uh, traded? I don't think there's much of anything similar. <laughs> I'm pretty mellow. You like salmon? <laughs> I do like salmon, Okay, yes. so you're Nordic okay. peoples. I don't know if salmon is Nordic. I think it's more, they have a fish in Minnesota called the loot fish. The loot fish. Yes. Just remember, the Viking helmets the only helmet in the NFL with a shofar on the helmet. <laughs> so uh, we have more in common with the Vikings than you might think. All right, uh, Mark, you're the chairman of the Jewish Federations of uh, North America. Part of your responsibilities, as I understand it, is getting 148 different Jewish federations to agree on anything. <laughs> Uh, how's that going for you, or are you just a glutton for punishment? It's a, it's a little bit of everything, but I will tell you, extremely proud of the fact that all these communities have really come through yes. in these very trying times. And uh, that's something uh, uh, we can all agree on, is that uh, we have a very strong Jewish community and thankfully uh, a vibrant one here in North America. I'm going to add to that that the real value of having a Jewish community such as Mark runs is when there's a crisis. You on could get normal, scale. On the normal times, everybody complains about it. But when there's a crisis, nobody does it better. Um, I'll use a, an analogous situation, the Red Cross. Everybody complains about the Red Cross, but when there's a hurricane or a natural disaster or something like that, they're there. they're there, they have the infrastructure, they have the capacity, and they have the experience to deal with problems. Just the same as the JFNA does, and we should be thankful for it, even though we are allowed to complain about it. Right. <laughs> and, that, and by the way, that's a perspective our parents had. Right. And, you know, we, we all were fortunate to grow up in, in generally thriving and peaceful times. And uh, they had the perspective of what happens when things don't go well. And uh, that perspective allows you to see how things should be. You know, I always say in, today everything is we're in an age of personalization. Uh, we're talking about in a, in a prior discussion about, you know, even your frozen yogurt, you, you pick your own toppings, you make it yourself. And there is a tendency today with certainly, I think my generation and younger, that people want to pick their charities. But what happens is the federations that really can scale and do the work that's not as sexy, so to speak, as picking the, the, the flavor of the day, uh, people, are, are, are not paying enough attention to. So I, yeah. Well, this, this uh, COVID crisis, the uh, anti-Semitic issues and social justice, all of the above shows you the true value of the Federation system. And in normal times, it's just taken for granted. Just a few more. Um, uh, Lenny, what do you prefer more, public speaking or having your teeth drilled? Teeth drilled. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be the case. Um, Lenny, wh who among you and your cousins have the most embarrassing or interesting pregame ritual, and would you share it? Uh, pregame ritual. Um, Hats backwards, salt over the shoulder. Um, I learned uh, that in sports fans tend to have what I call individual superstitions, and they're very private. They're private. We're not yeah. going to share those. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and, bec- and the reason that they're private is because if you do the math, even great teams don't win more than 60% of the time. So you have to be prepared for disappointment because at least 40% don't, don't, don't you're going to be disappointed. It. <laughs> and, and it's interesting. It's a story you talk about perspective of our parents as survivors. Uh, you know, when we were kids and giant fans and we'd oh, lose yeah. a game, uh, we'd be all heartbroken. And our dad would try to, to give us give perspective. Little, give a little perspective. So we'd say, kids, things could be worse. You could be the owners. <laughs> so uh, we, we joke about that sometimes when, when things get a little rough. You know, Lenny, they say in real estate, everything is location, 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 location. Is there a particular reason why real estate people like to repeat themselves? I, I think that um, <laughs> it's interesting because as I age and I see the world changing, while location, location, location is still the most important thing, it's less so because of the internet and because of people's moving around and everything else. I grew up with it as the most important and only thing. Today, I would say it's one of the more important parts of real estate, not the most important. Last one. This one's for you, Mark. They say that Minnesota has four seasons. They have before winter, winter, still winter, and the fourth season is still winter. <laughs> Which is your favorite? Well, uh, you know, uh, the people, football the, season. The people, of, <laughs> football season is great. The people of Minnesota are great, and I can tell you, we had the Super Bowl uh, a few years back. And I can tell you, all our committees, all the I've 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 learned how to do it, and never we we embraced it, and we never said the word cold. We were never cold, and we embrace it, and it's a That's very great. warm place, and we welcome people, and uh, they've been great to us. So and, and you've done tremendous things in Minnesota. Just for your benefit, the locals have two seasons: winter and road construction. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, look, I, Mark and 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 Lenny, your 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 parents, uh, your fathers, your mothers have stellar reputations in, in business. Your dad's built a company that they and, and now you uh, take great pride in. You both, together with your cousin Ziggy, um, have clearly carried on the traditions um, of your parents. I have no doubt that uh, they are and were uh, extremely proud of you. And uh, the lessons that you took away uh, certainly resonate for me, I'm sure, with the folks viewing this. Um, the way you approach philanthropy, not just as something th- that you do, but it's it's mission driven. Um, any closing remarks, Mark, that you just want to share before uh, we wrap? Just uh, you know, our, for my for myself, my parents, and our parents' legacy collectively. I know for, personally, it's something that's in my soul every single second uh, going forward. Uh, their example. Um, uh, their 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 life is an inspiration to me, and I hope for my whole family every single day. And um, very grateful for that legacy. And it's something we work every day, and I work every day to live up to because it's a very powerful legacy and uh, one we hope to continue. Well, I'm going to put a plug in for Yad Vashem. Um, I'm very proud. Nine years as as chairman. Um, I have all my four children and my grandchildren learned an awful lot about Holocaust and Holocaust remembrance. Um, I've tried to impart the same lessons to my cousin's children whenever I can because I learned them really from my father and uncle. And whenever we kind of get into some situation where I in the family where I think they're going a little bit off course, I invoke Harry and Joe, and they all back off right away. <laughs> That's like magic, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Look, the, the lessons that Yad Vashem promotes probably have never resonated more than in today's age of social unrest and uh, immigration issues and, and all the things and cross uh, you know, intersectionality and the values that we can bring, not just focusing on the tragedy of it, which of course is there, but these lessons of of resilience and moving forward and, and a respect for humankind and, and giving back and building community are incredible lessons. And it's just a privilege to have you both. Well, thank you. Um, thank thank you, you for all that you do. And this has been a great honor for me personally. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for spending this time with me getting to know Lenny and Mark Wilf and hearing about the profound impact their parents, Holocaust survivors, had on their personal and professional lives. As the son of a Holocaust survivor myself, I know just how deeply our parents' lives helped shape our own and the meaningful lessons that we learned firsthand from the bravest people we know. The lessons taught by people like Harry and Judith Wilf, Lenny's parents, and by Joe and Susie Wilf, Mark's parents, are those of resilience, the ability to respond to the evils of the Shoah through healing, the ability to recover by building trust and planning for the future, and the ability to thrive by inspiring others and building for future generations. Please join the American Society for Yad Vashem at one of our upcoming virtual galas to celebrate six noteworthy individuals who embody the spirit of resilience. Your support of the important work of Yad Vashem has never been more important. I invite you to go to yadvashemusa.org to find out more.